call them. Mm-hmm. And so I said, test uh, one, two, one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Is that working? So Absolutely. I said, uh, Check, 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 check. Check, one, two, three. Check, one, two. We have audio. Check audio. We are rolling in black. Views expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of WPSL. However, we encourage you to like and share them on Facebook. It's time for the Sue Ellen Sanders Show. The Sue Ellen Sanders. Welcome to the Sue Ellen Sanders Show. And we have an extremely timely guest with the holidays right around the corner. But... Um, Ron Disarelli from Safe Kids Coalition has got timely information no matter what time of year it is. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about um, may be pertinent to talking about wintertime or the holidays, but also applies all year round. And uh, my mind boggles at all the safety information that is out there. Yeah, there truly is a lot of safety information out there, all with one goal um, for children is to reduce those unintentional injuries for children. You know, unintentional injuries are 100% preventable. And before we go any farther, we we need to point out that our backdrop here, how cool is that? We're right here um, at White City Park. Yeah, near the boat ramp is what Cliff says. And, uh, of course, it's a rendering, but how cool is that, that it looks like we're on location there with White City Park? And um, that's kind of interesting that we could lead right into safety um, because, you know, it's holiday picture time, too. Everybody's taking pictures, and you're looking for a nice backdrop for your pictures. And... um, you know, White City Park it has nature. It's why you go there to take pictures um, because it's beautiful, natural setting. Uh, but there are alligators and snakes and other uh, things. And I see a lot of people putting their children, you know, the, like balancing them on something for a picture or um, or having them pose and um when, when you're taking photos of your family, you want to keep safety in mind as well. Oh, absolutely. You, if, especially if you're taking them outside in an area such as White City Park or even at the beach, um, you know, a nice wooded area, uh, there's wildlife. And so you're going to And they were there first. And they were there first, right? It's their their natural habitat. So you just have to be um, mindful of that. Uh Um, Search your surroundings before you stage your child in that position uh, to take pictures. Um, I would not suggest that they're balancing them on anything near the water um, because children are quick and they're impulsive. And if they decided to move quickly, they could, in fact, end up in the water where they're now intermingling with um, you know, Mother Nature the and wildlife, wildlife yes. and, and the water. So <laughs> I would I would say definitely let's not stand them anywhere that they have to balance um, themselves long enough to get a photo. And it's more and more, you know, this isn't necessarily just kids, but, you know, people are looking for the ultimate selfies and they're 
they've put themselves on vacation in some very dangerous situations and in some cases turned out to be deadly where, you know, you stood on the edge of a cliff, not you or me, because <laughs> we're still here, right. um, and, and took that one extra step and, you know, right. hurt yourself. Right. There was a, a video actually not too long ago that um, surfaced and um, very I'm very glad that the person in it actually was pulled out of the way, but they were standing um, at, a, at a subway station um, and where the trains are coming in, taking a selfie and had another bystander not grabbed them and pulled them in, they would have been hit by the train because they were leaning back over the track. And they're paying attention to the right angle on the phone camera. Correct. And, and not paying attention to their surroundings. Correct. So so as we're approaching the holidays and, and all times, you know, be aware and don't do dumb things just to get a cool picture. There are a lot of some of my favorite photos are totally candid um, with no extreme background or anything. They just... Natural. They are, yeah. They're natural. They're people happy and smiling or pensive. Actually, one of my favorite photos of my daughter when she was young, um, she was strawberry picking. Aww. And it was at the old Neil's You Pick 'em. Oh, yes. And yes, very um, she was bent down, and I happened to catch her as she with her little basket of strawberries she must have been about five six years old putting one in her mouth as she was putting one in the basket and it's one of my favorite photos of all times and it, there was no danger there was no right. excitement or anything like that it was just pure joy so anyhow we kind of digressed because we were looking at uh, our our nice visual of white city park and um uh, Rhonda was telling me the story of uh, somebody that she knew who had their photographs come back and they noticed in the photographs that there was an uh, alligator peeking out of a bush. <laughs> right, right behind where the children had just gotten their photos taken. Yeah, so that so so be be cautious. Uh, um there are a lot of, you know, first of all, Safe Kids Coalition covers such a wide range of safety issues and also covers the entire treasure coast yes correct. so you're a busy lady i am you are it's a good busy yes it is um i was uh talking about some of the hints in the newsletter that you just sent out which you forwarded a uh, safe kids newsletter that was a national newsletter correct and you know along you know, there's the highlights of the things that they're talking about right now, but you could click on just about any category and see tons more safety tips that are so overwhelming. And our administrative assistant, I was talking to her about a couple of the different things on there. She said, you know, we survived when we were kids and nobody knew about any of this stuff. Uh, but it was a different time and place, and it was also a time where you maybe had more family around you, um, uh, where you had um, less stuff right. around you. Uh, you know, they did have safety belts when I was a kid, um, and it wasn't required, but we used them. We didn't have car seats when I was a kid but I sure brought my kids home from the hospital in them so car seats have been around for how long oh my goodness uh to give you an exact date I couldn't do oh, no, that but just, I could just yeah. I I'm gonna honestly say my oldest will be 35 and I do remember that we had to have a car seat to bring her home okay from the hospital. so we're, look, we're looking, so we're at looking at a good least, little ways yeah, yes yeah. A, a, a quite a bit well, one of the questions that I had back in the day when I was putting my kids in the car seat actually was answered in this nice newsletter that, that I said, saw. And you could always you could look up safe, safe Kids and get a whole lot of information. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, when it's colder out and you have your little kid in a heavy sweater or a jacket, do you take the jacket off before you buckle them in their car seat? So absolutely. What we recommend is that you go out and turn your car on and warm your car up. Um, 
wrap your child in a blanket or wrap them in their jacket, but don't put the jacket all the way on. Um, once you have them secured in the car seat, you can then take a blanket and tuck it around them on the outside of them. Or, you know, if they're old enough, you just tell them to stick their arms out straight. If you feel they need the jacket on in the car because it's still a little cold, um, they put their arms out straight and then you slide their arms in it um, kind of backwards, if you mm -hmm. will, um, so that the back of the jacket is now across their chest. What we're trying to do is keep any excess material from being under those harness straps. Um, depending on how thick or how heavy that sweater or that jacket is, it could give enough room for the child to actually slide out of the car seat. Because you don't in want wiggle. We, you don't want any wiggle room. And the whole no. idea is you want the car seat safety harness to fit snugly. And some of the jackets, some of the thicker jackets, right. are you know inches uh, thick. And when you have them on. I, we don't have them on that frequently in Florida, but you know, if you're going up north, if you're traveling up north, and you have the thick uh, jacket on, that that could make it easier for your child if there's a car accident to slip out of the harness. Right. They actually are. Um, they did some research on this not too long ago, and there was a video, and I wish I could remember what um, hospital did it. Um, but of course, they use dolls. And the dolls actually came completely out of the jacket and out of the car seat because they couldn't compress the fabric um, on the jacket enough to restrain it tight enough. It, it's kind of, I think, along the same idea of flying in an airplane seat with your infant on your lap and your arms around your infant. Right. Um, and, you know, you you see people do that all the time because, of course, they're trying to save money and not purchase another uh, seat for their infant. But, you know, as infrequently as most of us fly, right. um, the most safe alternative is to buy the seat and strap the infant in in their right. car or seat. Or they actually sell, um, and it's FFA approved, an actual harness system that basically attaches to the parent that's traveling with that child um, and through the seatbelt system on the airplane. And so now you and the child, you know, for lack of a better term, become one in that seat. Okay. You're so gonna that's move together. There's yes. another option too. Right. And that, what do they call it? I, the airline I mean, safety I harness it, for infants. A vest. I think it's a safety vest um, for airplanes is what the, in you know, if you put enough phrases in Google, in, you'll into find Google, it. you can find anything, <laughs> but that that's, kind of new yes yeah and that's great because that saves you the money on buying an extra seat but it still keeps your right. child uh secure uh, because you're not you know the chances of a plane crash are not great but the chances of turbulence, turbulence. are is right. right so you know you want to make sure that that baby stays put and Absolutely. you know you you know you might like if if a suitcase is coming down on you you might um, without without even thinking about it put a hand out to catch the suitcase um, and th then have your child only with one hand right. so so well so we addressed uh, two of the travel issues that that I was first and foremost thinking about let's let's move to Toy safety, holiday safety, um, some of the things that um, the kids are going to be getting, um, celebrating their holiday, uh, and, and some of the situations, you know, you, we've got toys, but we also have family gatherings. Absolutely, absolutely. So first and foremost, when you're purchasing gifts for your child, you need to be purchasing age-appropriate gifts. Um, and you also need to consider their, their social development. You know, maybe they're eight, but, you know, as far as their development, maybe a toy that's aged for an eight-year-old is still not appropriate for them. Maybe they're a little immature for that yet. Um, so you want to take that into consideration when, you're consideration when you're purchasing a toy. And realize that if there's an age range on the toy, that's because the manufacturer has tested that to be an appropriate age um, for a child to play with that particular toy. Um, CBS this morning had a great story on about knockoff toys um, and how much, you know, more danger we're placing the children in by going online trying to buy a similar toy, but a knockoff toy that maybe hasn't had such stringent testing 
um, by the manufacturer. So I, I would consider that also. Um, maybe not going for those knockoff toys, but um, looking more so for the brand toys. Um, one of the other things that we'd, we'd really suggest is that if you're purchasing a toy that requires batteries, that um, you actually have a casing where you're having to use a screw or some type of mechanism to really lock that battery in. Um, button batteries especially, they're extremely dangerous for children. Oh yeah, we had that conversation yes. about what was it here? Or was it at a Safe Kids Coalition meeting? It was at a Safe Kids Coalition meeting. Yes, that that was a really scary thing. And I actually went home, found the video you shared, which was a video of a uh, young boy who had swallowed a button battery. Um, it's often fatal. Yes, but in this case, it wasn't fatal. It was just life changing and damaging, right. and. Uh, burned his throat, burned his lungs, his, his stomach, his intestines. It was yes, and he ended up um, at the time that that video ha was made. It was only I'm going to think it was two years after the incident, but he had had 30 surgeries up to that point, um, and will still require more as he grows. Um, what happens is you swallow that battery, and it's an electrical current, and it's now mixing with the the fluids inside our body, and it immediately starts to burn. Um, as it's traveling through the digestive tract. Um, it'll burn through the stomach, through the intestines. And as we, as a society, as a world, start making things smaller and smaller, we start using smaller and smaller batteries, like mm -hmm. button batteries. Um, you know, we all love greeting cards that play music, but, and kids love to play with them, open and close them, and open and close and them. Yeah, and you, you yeah. want to give your kid the greeting card because they're getting such a big kick out of opening and right. closing it. But if it's got the button battery in it, you want to keep a close eye on that. Exactly, because it's just a little cardboard tab that holds it in place. Um, you know, some toys have the button batteries in them, but they don't have a screw or a locking mechanism that holds it in place. Um, almost like a remote control because that's how this little boy um, actually got a hold of it. He was playing with a remote control because kids love remote controls. And that's something else that a lot of times you might give your kid to keep him or her just occupied for, occupied a, few for yeah. a few minutes. And the kids do love remotes. And so this little boy was like three or something he like was um, just right at two playing yeah. with the remote control and he they never thought about the fact that he could have swallowed the battery and um, but they did know that something was wrong just hours later right. and He's that's why they mm -hmm. were able to save his life right he, he started with a um, kind of a dry raspy cough and so as any mom you know you don't want to go rush into the doctor let's just wait to see how he's doing later um, but the cough continued to progressively get worse um, so they took him into the doctor who then did an x-ray and on x-ray they found the button battery um, traveling through his GI tract so thank goodness that the doctor was on top of it to take the x-ray right Absolutely. away because there are so many other things that could cause a dry cough right. too Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. so they discovered it and, and, you know, yet you said, you know, as you said, the, the little boy has had over 30 surgeries and that was just a couple of years after the incident. I'm sure there are more. And he, he, he can't, he was on a feeding tube for a very long time. Um, so I do believe he's now off of that feeding tube, but he also had a trach. Um, and they were working to, to be able to remove that, that permanent trach on him. But as I said, that requires more and more surgeries because of where it burned through the right. esophagus on him. Right. Well, after, so, so just to, to keep you posted that I belong to the Safe Kids Coalition as part of my day job at the Early Learning Coalition. And each time I go to one of the quarterly meetings, I am just amazed at, things that I didn't know to worry about right. and thank goodness my kids are grown and safe um, but soon they're going to start having babies and I'm going to need to know these things and also in my job at the Early Learning Coalition I send out communications to uh, parents and families who have little kids and so I'm always trying to put without being a scared Right, you, know, you don't want to scare. Yeah, right. I, I don't want to scare them, but at the same time, I want them to be cautious. I want them to be aware because these are things 
that I didn't know. And the button batteries, um, you could find that that video online. And sure. after I went to the meeting, I went home and found it and then posted it on the ELC website and then posted it on my, my own Facebook page too because I thought it was important enough with the holidays coming right. to share. Um, and, and, you know, but any battery and, you know, some kids, boy, they just will eat anything. They'll put anything in their mouth. Yeah. They will chew on anything. And and then, you know, b I know you're safe kids, but think about pets, too. Yes. Because we've got, uh, you know, dogs that will eat anything, too. Right. And it would be just as dangerous for them as well. Uh, so so the, the one thing is look for, if it has a battery, look for something where it locks in right. into if the case. Right, it's casing. actually locked. And, you know, what, you know, the thing you have to think about with children is, um, you know, a lot of times you hear child-proof. I'm going to be the first to tell you that there's nothing that's child-proof, but there's plenty that's child-resistant. Um, and the difference between that is when you think about child-proof, you think there's no way they can get into it because you've proofed it and that can't happen. Um, child-resistant is really just something to slow them down until you can get there. So even though there may be a screw in place there or there may be um, a, sw a little lever that switches to hold that casing for the battery in place, that's just making it child resistance. Nothing um, is better than active supervision. supervision. We say active supervision mitigates hazard. And, you know, you may have a budding engineer Absolutely. and you're so excited that he or she is able to to open things like that right but that means you have to to watch more closely and you know we're not really just talking about little kids here because you know you're you also could be when when you're talking about age appropriate presents if say you have a 10 year old that you're buying a present for you've got to think about their two-year-old brother or sister absolutely. too right absolutely um yeah, I can give you an example of that. You know, my um, my youngest is 19, and then I have a grandson who's 13. So for a while, when he was younger, around three, he um, was living in my house. So here I have a 13-year-old who loved to build and loved to make stuff with, you know, the magnetics and the connects mm -hmm. and the little pieces. Um, and so we had a rule in the house that if he was going to pull those down and he was going to play with them, then he had to play in his room behind locked doors. And then when he cleaned up, he needed to come and let one of us know, one of the adults know, so that we could then go in his room and make sure that all of the magnets had been picked up and all of the little pieces were picked up. So, you know, that was just kind of probably a little overkill, but that's based off of what I do for a living. Yes, so, yeah. you know, I am a little overkill like that, I admit. Um, but you all, you know, you just want to make sure that if you have an older child with a younger child coming into the home or, or who lives in the home, that you're explaining to the older child that this is not, you know, a safe toy to play around near the, the younger one. And maybe it's best that they play in an area where they're, you know, kind of by themselves so that the younger child is not getting into those smaller pieces that they sh you know, could easily swallow and choke on. Well, that leads to a whole other category, that category of visiting grandparents or visiting relatives. Absolutely. And maybe their home is not childproof, childproof or right. the access to the pool is not childproof or the access to the back door or to uh, the road that is out front. Um, and that's something that families need to be aware of too. Right. We always say that um, change of circumstance uh, can have a lot to do with an unintentional injury in the home. You know, change of location, change of circumstance, out of your routine. Um, you know, we have a pet door in my house, but for my dogs, they let themselves in and out onto the patio and then from the patio into the backyard. But s I also have a pool, um, which has all the safety features around it. However, a child coming in to visit, you know, my nephew's coming in next week. Um, should he bring a smaller child with him? That would be a total change of, of venue and circumstance for them. And they may not realize that that pet door is dangerous. And that a child could easily escape and get into the yard. But they're going to watch the dog going through it. And, and that they climb right this after is, them. Yeah, yes. this, is, this yes. is a fun thing. Yes, and, and I will admit that. I mean, like I said, you know, I have four grandchildren. And at one time or another, they all thought it was a blast. And the 11-year-old grandchild still thinks it's hilarious to crawl in and out of the pet door instead of opening the slider and closing it. Um, so those are things as a homeowner. Um, as a grandparent that you have to be aware of. That, you know, this is not something that's in their home, but it could 
potentially uh, put them at risk for some type of injury. Well, uh, the last time you were here, we talked about uh, the, I think the situation with the cruise ship had just happened with the grandfather who was holding um, his uh, less than two year old granddaughter up to a window he thought right. was, closed, was closed that was open. Uh, but you have, you don't have to be in a cruise ship on vacation for something like that to happen. Right. You know, you may not be aware in the home you're visiting that they, you know, regularly don't latch the windows right. or that they have, you know, h how can you tell? Do you, should you do a walkthrough? When you first get to somebody's house? I would, I would definitely say that if you're traveling and that you're going to stay in someone's home, um, you know, like my children come to my house all the time, so they know what I do and don't do in my home as far as locking and securing and what things are locked up. But if they were traveling to another family member's house, say out of state, then I would definitely suggest, you know, that they check, are the medications put up high so that their children can't get into it? Um, are, do, are there car keys put up high so that the kids can't by chance get a hold of their keys and use that as a place to play hide and seek where it could be very dangerous for them um, you know if if it's a two-story home do they have bars on the windows and if not um, if, if it's a c case of where they could leave those windows open maybe ask them not to open them while you're there and leave them closed and locked so that the child doesn't risk pushing the screen out and falling out of the window um, I certainly wouldn't be offended if someone came to my home with the child and wanted to check to make sure that it was safe for them. How about gun safety? How, how do you phrase it when you're going to somebody's house and you want to know, do you have any guns any weapons in your home? In my, yeah, I think you just phrase it that way. Um, I'm bringing your children, whether you do or you don't. So say you don't have weapons. You know, I, I want to have a nice vacation, a nice trip. I want to avoid any chance that there could be a tragedy. Um, we don't have weapons in our home, but do you have them in your home? And if you do, are they locked up and secured and out of the reach of the children? Because it, I think it used to be what you don't know doesn't hurt you. And you'd kind of like say, well, I'm just not even going to ask because it's embarrassing. Right. But you in today's world, you just can't do that anymore. No, we have to advocate for our children and our children's safety. Because if we don't, who's going to? Um, so I don't think asking the tough questions I is a problem. One of the things I read about uh, probably a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago, was a teenage girl who uh, they had to call 911 for because she got stuck trying to climb down a chimney. Did you read it? I did not. You did. Okay. I'm not surprised, well, she, but I, I did not. She ha was coming in late at night, and I'm sure there was some alcohol that was involved. Um, and she didn't want her parents to know how late she was coming in. And so she thought, well, Santa Claus can do it. And I'm sure oh my goodness. the alcohol or something clouded her judgment. And she didn't think about the fact that Santa Claus climbing down a chimney is a way different situation right. than um, a teenage girl coming down the chimney. And she got caught in the chimney. And um, either she had, I, I, I don't know if she had her cell phone or somebody else she called out and her friend uh, called 911 for her. See, and in that circumstance, it would have been much better to let your parents know how late you really were. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of getting stuck in the chimney, now 911's going to show up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, then, then that's that's a little bit scarier for them. Uh, right. Yeah, and she, she was safe. She wasn't hurt. Um, she was a little little covered in soot. Yes. Um, and it certainly was a, a story to tell. But keeping in mind that you know, also during family festivities, you know, maybe you might drink a little bit more than you usually do, or you might be in conversation with uh, family members that you don't see all the time, and so you may not be paying as close attention as you do to your kids at home. Absolutely, uh, absolutely, and we kind of relate that back to water watchers when you're having a pool party and you assign yeah. somebody... Um, 
to watch the children while they're in the pool, and that's their only job is to watch the children that are swimming. They're not talking on their phone. They're not texting. They're not reading a book. They're not drinking, um, eating. They're just watching the children. So I kind of think that if you're going to a large party like that and you are taking your children, then you, you need to speak with um, whomever you're there with, your, you know, your significant other or other attendees, and have someone pretty well assigned at all times to be keeping eyes on the children and what they're doing um, so that you don't lose track of one. And then that one ends up getting into something that they shouldn't. And because other than water safety, there's a lot of other things that they could be getting into, too. And, uh, you know, the, back to those kids that want to taste everything and eat everything and swallow everything. Um, there are a lot of things that are not candy that look like candy. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I'll never forget being in a conference um, in Washington, D.C. and hearing the Safe Kids State Court Noto for coordinator for the state of Colorado saying that they were having a tremendous amount of issues with believe it or not young toddlers who were getting into edibles marijuana edibles and ending up in the emergency rooms extremely ill um, because they thought they just wasn't getting put away right so they look like cookies you know where maybe it says to take one bite um, and then the children would eat the whole cookie and now you, you have a problem where the gummy bears you're only one or two but yet they're eating handfuls um, because it's being left out you know with us too we look at um, the liquid nicotine uh, and that's something you know you would you and I would probably go oh that's really gross but one it's favorite flavored but it's probably still really gross to taste but children will pick up and eat and chew and drink anything that you leave sitting around especially if it looks pretty it, right or smells good right laundry pods you know candles like candy yeah candles yeah. tea candles have those button batteries in them yeah. So um, you're right. Children will put anything in their mouth, especially if it's attractive to them. What are some of the other things that we should be aware of over, say, the winter and the holiday season? Well, one of the things that um, if you have a real Christmas tree, make sure you're keeping it watered. Okay, because once they dry out and now you have Christmas lights on it, should one of those bulbs short out, um, it puts your tris- tree more at risk of catching fire. So you want to make sure that you're keeping it watered so that it doesn't dry out and it doesn't get brittle. Um, also realize if you have a little one, those lights are very bright. They're, they're pretty. Um, and so they pose two hazards to your children. So those would be choking over the bulbs themselves. Um, and believe it or not, um, strangulation, where they go over and start pulling on the lights and then they can get the lights wrapped around themselves. So they can either pull the tree on themselves or they get tangled in the lights. So you you definitely want to keep an eye on that. Um, If they're really little and really really curious, um, maybe some type of baby gate or something around it to block it would be a good idea. Um, Also, if you're purchasing a bike, a scooter, um, one of those little mini bikes that they buy for kids, buy a helmet too. so there's no question that one goes with the other. One goes with the other. If you're going to buy them something to actually go out and ride, then you definitely want to buy them a helmet. You know, when we go out and teach our uh, bicycle pedestrian safety programs in the schools, the one thing we, we tell the kids all the time is that you only have one brain. And if you get it damaged severely enough, then you can't fix it. And wearing a helmet is going to help mitigate that damage. You know, it's, it's going to help save their brain. Um, and we break it down a little more because we're talking to them and they're younger. But, you know, we always talk about a car engine. You know, sometimes if, you, if your engine gets sick or it gets broken in a car, you can fix it. But sometimes if the injury is really bad, we can't. And so in wearing a helmet, that helps to protect their engine. How do you address kids and adults too who think it's more manly to go without and everybody knows that everybody's right. got somebody like that in their their neighborhood where you know most of the kids are uh rollerblading or uh, skateboarding or biking with a helmet and then you've got the one family that never wears a helmet right. because they just think it doesn't look cool um in my neighbor actually i was talking to my daughter about this today she, they, she just moved into a beautiful new home and um she said mom whereas on her other street all of the children wore helmets when they were out on their scooters their skateboards their rollerblades whatever it was their bicycles she goes Our, my two kids are the only ones 
that have a helmet when they're outside riding their bikes and playing. So I said, well, maybe your two can be the ones that affect change in the neighborhood. You know, maybe. It's going to be tough with it's that peer be tough. pressure. It, yes, yes. Uh, but, you know, it maybe, maybe if they ask her about it, she could say, well, I guess you're the only your brains are more valuable and we want to protect them. Right? right, right. So we do, you know, uh, we do a lot of education at community events when we provide bike helmets with the parents. And we get, we do get a lot of um, positive feedback from the parents who will say, oh, no, they don't have a helmet. But then once we provide education, they allow us to fit the child. And we can only hope that if we're giving them a helmet and we fit it properly, that they're actually going home to wear it. I think the pushback more so comes from the children than the parents because we've heard it all. It's ugly. It messes up my hair. It's hot. It makes me sweaty. Um, and so we just kind of try to shoot those all down when we're educating the children. Um, as far as saying, you have to keep your brain safe. And then we have um, concussion goggles that we use with them. And we'll put the concussion goggles on and they have to w- walk this bright yellow line. Well, they can't because it blurs their vision and it gives them three lines instead of one. And then we're able to say, you know, with our older fifth, sixth graders that, you know, would you like to live like this? But that's permanently you all because the time. right yeah. this it could happen you know it's a simple thing wear your bike helmet I, it's interesting because my children did wear bike helmets growing up and all the kids in the neighborhood did um, and uh, then there was a period of time where you know they were driving and so they weren't if they were caught without a seatbelt on even before there were, were laws, um, then they they lost their right to drive. But as an, a, a young adult, my daughter wanted a bike for Christmas last year, and I said, did you get a helmet? And her reply was, su- kind of surprised me. She said, well, of course I already did. Good for her. And she, she was like... Good for her. It was... She, ironically a no-brainer um because but that was the expectation from you when she was growing up yeah you know as as with my daughter that is the expectation with her children because it was the expectation I had with her um as she was growing up and really all you have to do is hear one story about a child who who damaged their brain or who got hurt or uh fell um in a I, kn- I know I've heard stories before about children who fall and they think that it's not anything serious and then it turns out to be Very a lot serious. more serious. Right. Yeah. Head injuries. They aren't don't always manifest right then and there at that moment. It, you know, it could be 15 minutes later, a couple of hours later where they start to... Um, not feeling well, they're very sleepy, maybe their speech starts slurring, um, they're just not themselves, and that's when you notice that they've suffered some type of traumatic brain injury, and and you need to get medical treatment. So you can't be with your kid all the time when they're riding their bike in the neighborhood? How do you communicate to them that they need to tell you when something like that has happened without scaring them? Well, I think it's just being honest with them you know if you fall off your bike just really simple if you fall off your bike I need to know um you know especially if you hit your head you know it's no more so than if you know a a stranger were to try to approach them when they're riding their bike they need to be able to feel comfortable to tell you you know I fell off my bike and maybe I got a little scraped up here maybe it didn't but you know my helmet hit the ground hopefully they're wearing a helmet um and as long as the helmet is not dented, then, you know, the fall wasn't too bad. But if the helmet's damaged in any way, then uh, that was a pretty significant fall, and you want to keep an eye on them. Um, if, if they did not have a helmet on, then you must definitely want to keep an eye on them for a good little bit to make sure that, that you're seeing no change in personality in them. Make sure they don't right. have a headache and right. that, that anything is... That they're not having a headache, they're not vomiting. Um, that their speech is not slurring, that their vision is not blurred. Um, One of the signs of concussion for a female, go figure, is they get really emotional. Hmm. So they tend to get a little emotional and cry even more so than normal over the littlest things that you would say, why are you crying over that? Because normally they wouldn't. Um, But because they've fallen and they've hit their head, they get a little more emotional. Wow. Uh, well, we, we kind of moved on from the Christmas tree, but w- I, I didn't get a chance to ask you the burning question about 
do you leave your tree on when you're leaving the house? It's really cool to come home to your Christmas lights on outside and then you see the tree silhouetted in the darkness of the hall. That's really a neat feeling to do that. But is it dangerous? Um, personally, I don't leave mine on. Uh, especially if it was a real, if it's a real tree instead of an artificial tree, I wouldn't leave it plugged in and leave it on. You just don't know. Um, I mean, you have a, a natural tree in your home. It's a real tree. And should any of those lights short out, it could potentially spark the tree on fire. So mine's artificial, but I still, I don't know. There's just something about it that yeah. I unplug it when I leave. I turn, I don't even just turn it off. I unplug it. And overnight as well. I leave, right. Yeah. I don't leave it on overnight. Well, they had the little, uh, buttons where you can just step on the button and turn, turn it, it on, on yeah. like first thing so the first person uh, up in the morning can turn it on sure. while sure. while people are, are home and it is really nice to see um, but you still you want to be cautious and you right. know make sure you want to have a lovely holiday yeah. instead of having a tragic holiday so if it's as simple a thing as unplugging the tree before you go to sleep at night just unplug the tree or turn the lights off what are some other fire hazards that go along with the holidays? Candles. Everybody loves to burn candles yeah. so that they can smell the cinnamon and the apple pie smells and the cranberry. And the, my son's favorite candle is, uh, I think it's um, cookies and cream, something that oh, he, yeah. he gets. He yeah. loves that yeah. candle. But, um, and we were, it's funny, we were just talking about this at work the other day. One, easily you could leave it on when you go to bed and it burns down to absolutely nothing. And then the glass heats up and the glass explodes and it could cause a fire. Um, but remember that if you have cats in your home, cats are very curious. So if mm -hmm. you're going to leave a candle burning um, and if it's flickering enough, it could actually draw them over to just swat the candle one good time and knock it down. So if you're going to have candles burning in your home, you definitely want to pay attention um, to where you have it and then put them out when you're leaving the home and when you're going to bed at night. Mm -hmm. Kind of like kids, if you can't actively supervise, then you don't want a candle burning. Or have it where they can, you know, you can't, they right. can't reach it. But, you know, I, I do see sometimes when I go to people's houses, they have multiple candles burning yes. in different places, like in the guest bathroom to kind of mm -hmm. show you that's where the guest bathroom is. And But in, in some of those areas that are tucked away, you might at the end of the night not remember. To go and, and to yeah. put it out, to extinguish it. Absolutely. So so yeah. maybe maybe make a point of saying to your uh, spouse or, or older child, don't let me forget to get rid of... To extinguish that candle. Get, uh, get that, that candle yeah. out. Um, and, you know, as far as um, the safety of having the candles burn overnight, you also have relatives that may be coming to your house that maybe smoke cigarettes right yes definitely um my recommendation that for not sure is my you, house you, right that's yeah. what i'm trying to say nicely not <laughs> yeah. in my house if you're going to come to my house and smoke you're going to go outside and smoke on the back porch mm -hmm. um and if the smoke starts coming into my house you're going to go further than the back porch so that so that we're not smelling in the home because we're not smokers so when when people finish smoking a cigarette and they toss it into the ground no never it should not just be tossed in the grass especially if but we're you having a dry I time. see it all the time but you know if we're having a really dry season that's really quick to to uh, get a fire started the grass is dry it's brittle it's ready to go and then you throw a lit cigarette um, and then here you go you have a fire going so. about uh, fireplaces and fire pits I know when oh, my right. kids were teenagers I would um, spend a lot of time uh, worrying when they were, they had a fire pit out back behind the house and I would lay awake in bed and wait till everybody had gone home. I could hear them leaving because they were old enough to handle themselves and I would not go to sleep until the fire, fire was completely out. Right, and, and that's definitely our suggestion. Um, whether you're using, you know, if you're using a propane fire pit, you want to make sure that you get that tank turned all the way off um, and that the flame is completely down. Um, if you're using a fire pit where you're using, you know, those wood logs as fire starters and then you have wood in there, you don't want to go to sleep and leave that sitting out in your backyard 
um, because it, again, it takes a couple of seconds. We all know the wood pops when it's burning for some of that to pop and come outside of the fire pit because maybe you don't have the screen on or maybe your fire pit doesn't come with this, the screen that covers it up to stop that um, kindling from popping all over. So you definitely want to make sure that that's completely extinguished before you go to sleep. Um, you know, not to mention for us also, because we do, we do a lot of smoked meat um, during the holidays, you know, in the smoker. And that's the same for us because it could possibly that the meat is done, but yet we still have plenty of charcoal in there um, and wood chips. And so I don't want to just leave it out there unattended and not pay attention to it and allow that to be something that starts a fire. So even if you got to water it down, mm -hmm. you can definitely water it down so that you can make sure that it's completely extinguished before you go to bed. How about an indoor fireplace? Because I, I do the I mean, same thing. I used to lay away. I'm going to say if you're going to use an indoor fireplace, then you definitely d make sure that you um, have all of the appropriate, you know, the smoke detectors, the carbon monoxide detectors. You need to have all of that um, in the home. Do you have to stare the fire down before you go to sleep? A lot of people won't do that. And, you know, a lot I, I will. North, they use the fireplace <laughs> um, to actually heat their home. So right. The fireplace so they goes keep all night up. long. Yeah. Um, and so. As long as they, the flume is clean uh -huh. um, and that soot is cleaned off every year, you're reducing the fire that way from the fire pit. But, you know, then you have to be a little more concerned about, you know, the carbon monoxide building up in the home and making sure that you have the detectors. Um, and they have a lot of different ones. Um, they have ones that plug into the outlet. Uh, they have some that you just kind of sit up on the shelf. And then they have others that you attach to the wall. So you can pull the screen across to to Correct, contain to keep that kindling from popping out because you you were talking about the popping and right. a lot of times especially if you've used a fire starter and then once the wood is catching on there may be some popping. Right. Um, so yeah, I've come a, a long way with the fireplaces with being able to go upstairs, but I do make sure that we have the smoke detectors and you know. It's probably a good idea if you own a fireplace and use a fireplace that you are aware of fire safety. Right. Have uh, a fire extinguisher yeah. in the home. Oh, definitely. Yes. Have a fire extinguisher. Even in with the a home. grill. Even with the grill. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we if you're going to deep fry your turkey, I mean, it's all over every time we do it, but you can't fry a frozen turkey. You're going to have no fun dropping a fr frozen turkey into, you know, a hot. Uh, three Ooh, gallons of oil. that's something I did not know. I've yes. never cooked a frozen, uh, a, a yeah. fried turkey, yes. but so, so, so you it can't, has to be yeah. completely thawed. I mean, it's best if you get it thawed and then you can let it sit out for, you know, you don't want it to sit too long, but maybe like 45 minutes, let it get to room temperature so that when you're putting it at that oil that's hit 350 degrees, you're putting it in slowly um, so that it's not splashing because you're running off a propane tank that has a flame on the bottom of, of the pot that you're frying in. And so if that oil starts splashing wow. over the side, yeah. it'll ignite quickly. Um, and some of the biggest mishaps have been people taking turkeys that didn't completely thaw, which is what? Ice, basically, mm -hmm. and sticking it in the oil that's at 350 degrees. And it will just shoot the oil off like it's a rocket. And then it hits that flame that's being run by the propane tank, and it just explodes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, at uh, Thanksgiving time, we went to a friend's house, and they had a trash can turkey. Have you ever seen that? I saw on a Facebook for the first time. Yeah, I had never um, seen it. And so they had it. They had it. It was kind of like a little fire pit, but then it was with in a trash can, and it took a lot less time to cook than actually in a traditional oven. Uh, but you know, of course, I was worried about safety because that's what I do right I mean I didn't have kids to worry about it was just us grown-ups but I still um and, and you know the the other thing that you don't think of when you're at a family gathering and, I, and I'm remembering now the situation that uh, one of the the people that was at the Thanksgiving gathering had a little two-year-old that was adorable little two-year-old and she was throwing the ball to the dogs and having a great time throwing the ball to the dogs. And all of a sudden we heard a big crash and realized that she'd taken a beer bottle oh and no. thrown it like it was the ball for the dogs. a ball for the dogs. How creative. Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was that was kind of interesting. Uh, we, we'd like to judge it because it was the wrong kind of beer. <laughs> 
Might have been. <laughs> she, <laughs> she didn't like the label. <laughs> yeah. Oh, bless yeah. her heart. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, just in a split second, though, yeah. see how quick that, that changed? Kids are quick. It did. And her dad was Johnny on the spot and was went in and, and, and picked her up and handed her off to me and um, then was cleaning up the, the glass. But... Um, and may and then mom made sure that she had shoes on just because you don't know even when it's cleaned up if there's a little, if there's piece little there. pieces of glasses so you know i, I don't want to ruin the holiday by thinking about all of the stuff that could happen but i think it's important to be aware absolutely like i said it's active supervision and if you're having passive supervision kids are quick they're going to find something to get into that they shouldn't be in, getting into, um, and it may or may not hurt them, you know, just because they're kids. They're kids. They're young. They're curious. They want to learn. And how do they learn? By touching and exploring. So we just have a couple more minutes. Okay. And if you had, you know, just your top things to, to deal with for the month of December and for uh, the colder weather, what would you you call them even if we've talked about them before what are the top safety i'm going to say if you're traveling and you're traveling with your children because unfortunately every year we see really horrific horrific accidents um during the holidays with people traveling and so first of all if your child is um in a booster seat um as opposed to a car seat with a five-point hanger make sure that they're able to sit up and stay positioned in the seat belt correctly okay we want to make sure that they don't get out of place with that seatbelt so that it's not effective in an accident. Well, especially if you're on a long trip and they're slumped over because they're sleeping, right. they might have displaced part of it. Correct. And so if they're young, if they're, you know, small enough, you could always put them just for the trip back into a car seat with a five-point harness that has a higher weight on it so that you're making sure that if they fall asleep, they're in the correct seating position. Um, don't put those big fluffy jackets under those harness straps. You know, heaven forbid there's, uh, you know, an accident on the interstate that could give them enough room. Not to mention, um, once the car does warm up, they're going to be miserable and overheated. Yeah. And yeah, then they're going to make your life as a driver miserable because you can't get them out of the jacket. Yeah. So make everybody happy. Warm the car up. Put them in. And then just, you know, tuck a blanket around over top of them once over they're harnessed the in. Right. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. And now, now I kind of remember it. It's been 20 some odd years but i kind of remember doing the blanket thing when it was colder and it's hard enough to get little kids in and out of their jackets anyhow oh absolutely so you might as well wait and put it on uh rhonda cerilla is cerilli has been my guest she is the safe kids coalition coordinator uh the director of the safe kids coalition for the treasure coast and how can people reach you they can call the office at 462 3501. And then you got a website, of course. That we do. People we do. It's um, safekidsstlucyfl.org. So thank you for joining me. Thank and you. now my head is full of great tips. Have a, have a great week. Have a good holiday season. We'll be back here next week with more. Awesome. Thank you. The Sue Ellen Sanders Show, weekends on WPSL. Another one of the many reasons why we're the talk of the Treasure Coast.